So tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the punk scene, because that's kind of what led you into, you know, the groups you were in later. Just give us a little bit of a, you know, background on that, because we love to talk about, you know, how people found the, how, how people found the scene. Yeah. You know, like, I, you know, I grew up on the Southwest side of Chicago uh, and, um, you know, I spent two times between two different neighborhoods really uh, growing up, which was kind of part of my, my radicalization story too. Um, my, you know, my parents are Italian immigrants who came to the U S in, in the sixties. Um, so they settled in a small area on the Southwest side of Chicago where all the other Italian families from the same village kind of settled too. Right. Uh, and it was, you know, a very kind of middle class, maybe even lower middle class um, kind of neighborhood uh, that my grandparents lived. But when I was born, my parents moved out of there to kind of like a, you know, a, a middle class white suburb outside of the city of Chicago because they wanted me to go to a better school. Uh, mm. But, you know, they were working seven days a week, uh, you know, 14 hours a day. So I was really raised by my grandparents in that old Italian neighborhood on the south side of Chicago but I went to school in this, you know, kind of, you know, like upper middle class, you know, suburban neighborhood, and I didn't have any friends in either place. So I kind of like grew up without any friends. So I found the punk rock scene kind of in between those two groups. You know, I was starting to become an outsider mm-hmm. because I felt like I was starting to act out because I was looking for my parents' attention. You know, I felt right. abandoned. And that's really what set me down the road, I think, looking for a sense of like camaraderie which made me really vulnerable. But yeah, I found the punk rock movement on the Southwest side of Chicago. There was always a really strong, you know, Chicago punk rock scene bands like naked Ray gun and um, effigies. And, um, you know, I mean, like so many amazing bands that then spawned other really great bands. Uh, and, um, I just remember going to, you know, sneaking out and going to shows at like, you know, 12 and a half or 13 years old. Um, and, you know, sneaking into like shows that probably weren't all ages shows at the time, too. <laughs> Places like Man, the city kids are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like right. I like where I grew up in Blue Island was right on the southwest edge of the of the city. So right across the street, we could see Chicago, like yeah. literally right. Like the stoplight right across the street right. was Chicago. And we would, you know, take the train and, and you know, go into the city and, and we would call ourselves city boys. But technically we lived like a block and like across from the city. Oh, that's so, funny. Yeah. And it's a, I, I spent a couple of years in high school outside of Detroit and the, the Midwest scene is, it's a, it's a, it's a hardcore scene, man. The, the, there was some pretty, pretty aggressive dudes that shows like, you know, in downtown Detroit. You know, I, I, uh, my compared first to like, you're saying compared to like Gilman or something. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, spent, I spent some time in downtown Detroit. I didn't spend any time at Gilman. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I can imagine that you were definitely like, uh, exposed to a lot of different people there too. It was a, it's a pretty intense, you know, there's a lot of, I feel like the Midwest, there's like this, always like this underlying angst, you know, in the hardcore scene. Like, it's like, you know, it's not at either of the, either of the coasts. But the music is so good, but there's almost a, like this, like prove yourself kind of attitude that goes on there. But the, like, there are some great bands from, from Chicago. I mean, and it comes through in the music too, right? Like each, each city's got its own little flavor based on the kind of angst that they totally, have too. Totally. Know? Totally. Um, so, so you were 12 or 13. And so, I mean, probably 13, well, I'd say I was probably 13 when I got into punk rock and then 14 when I got recruited out of that kind of punk rock scene into being a skinhead. So it was 1987, I'd say, when I became a skinhead. Well, and this is a kind of a timely week to do this because Tom Metzger just died this week. <clears throat> and did you know him? Who is that? Uh, Tom Metzger in the 70s was a clan clansman and a clan leader, a very kind of a prominent white supremacist even in the 70s. And in the 80s became kind of a, a pioneer because he took skinheads under his wing. Uh, he was, um, kind of made fame. One of the things that, that made him infamous, I should say, was the case of, uh, Mulligetta Syrah, the murder of Mulligetta Syrah in Portland, uh, from, uh, uh, what he called the, the war skinheads, the white Aryan resistance was his organization. And he started to like find these younger skinheads and, and really be like, you know, the godfather to like, uh, what they were doing and like, you know kind of amp them up and stuff. And, and, uh, and they ended up killing, uh, you know, a Portland citizen, uh, an immigrant by the name of Mulligata Syrah. 
and uh, went to prison for it. But Tom Metzger was, um, uh, in, I think in civil court, found guilty of kind of participating in that. So he was sued. Uh, but he was really prominent, um, and I think he was sued by the Southern Poverty Law Center, but he was really prominent in the 80s and 90s, and then went really quiet for a while. And then, you know, once Charlottesville hit and people like David Duke started to make a comeback, we started to hear a little bit more from Tom Metzger. But yeah, he just, uh, he died, and and, uh, and uh, he just died this week, I think. Uh, yeah. I don't know what from. He was <clears throat> in his was, 80s. I think it was cancer. Yeah, he was in his 80s, I know that. Yeah, he just to put it in context, Joshua, the skinheads that were around um, the Sonoma County area when we were kids were all influenced by Tom Metzger's um, the mm. the war skins. I mean, they really were. And there was a the skinhead Woodstock was just outside of uh, Sonoma County. Um, you know, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, in the late in the late eighties, and so Metzger. I mean, in you know, in punk terms, for me, he was pretty key in traumatizing a lot of young punk kids because he was in, emboldening really violent people that were already brewing their violence to go out and be who they were, basically, and and or who they thought they were, you know. And as we know from your story, Christian, that that is, you know, all of that is is completely changeable, which is the the really amazing part of, you know, being a human being is, you know, you get opportunities and you take them or you don't. And, but, um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on him because, you know, obviously he was a, he was not a good man, you know, and he, he never really repented for any of the things that he did. So he did not, no, he went to, he went to the end. Yep. Um, but so you're basically, you're young, you're kind of like trying to get your parents' attention. It sounds like looking for some attention in general. So just talk about how that, that the kind of the, I guess I'm, you know, I, I know your story well, cause I've, I've watched a bunch of the documentaries. I've, I've listened to the podcast. I have your most recent book. It's the next one on my list. I'm finishing something right now. So I'm jumping into that next, but, um, you know, talk about being sort of a vulnerable kid. Cause I think that's where people miss the understanding of what happens. I mean, you're, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I guess to set the baseline, I was a pretty privileged kid, actually. You know, my, my parent, I, I was surrounded by love. You know, I had, even if my parents weren't there because they were off running, you know, a small business and struggling to do that, we had a home. I, you know, I, I, there weren't any vices in my home, you know, like they were immigrants and they struggled when they came, you know, to the U.S. in the mid sixties and they were the victims of prejudice. So they, you know, it wasn't something I learned right. at home. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was surrounded by grandparents and aunts and uncles that loved me too and had a roof over my head. So I, I didn't really want for anything except for the attention that I didn't think I was right. getting from my parents. So I went out and I, you know, I kind of looked for it uh, at first by, um, you know, sc- you know, screaming very silently for their attention by doing things that would make them look. Uh, and then, you know, when they weren't doing that, when they still weren't paying attention, then I just kind of went off and I tried to replace them. And I tried to, you know, I was, and I think like every person on earth, I was looking for a, 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 an identity, a community and a purpose, right? I was at that age, even at 14 years old, I was at that age, even if I wasn't feeling abandoned by my parents, I was drifting and trying to develop who I was, uh, as everybody is at that age. Uh, and um, because I was angry, because I hit what I call these metaphorical potholes in my life's journey, I kind of got detoured to the fringes where there was somebody waiting for me with, uh, you know, kind of a pitch for that identity, community, and purpose and saw in me somebody who was vulnerable. I was a good kid, man. I was shy. Uh, I, you know, I didn't really, I had no, I was bullied. I didn't really have very many friends. Uh, I was a good kid. Like I didn't swear at my parents. I didn't talk back to my parents. But when I started to like drift away from them, I started to like very quietly try to, you know, replace them. And at 14 years old, uh, it found me. You know, I was standing in an alley in 1987 and this guy walked up to me and I was smoking a joint, you know, because I was, you know, trying to piss my parents off and and (laughs) acting out. And this guy walked up to me with a shaved head and boots and it was 87. So really nobody knew what a skinhead was. And certainly 14 year old me didn't know what a skinhead was. But he comes up to me and he pulls the joint from my mouth and he looks me in the eyes and he says, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. Whoa. And I was like, I don't, you know, I didn't say it, but I'm thinking like, I don't know what a communist is. I don't even know (laughs) if I've met a Jewish person. I don't even know what the word docile means. And I'm like frozen, but like the next thing he does is super important because he put his hand on my shoulder Mm -hmm. and he asked me what my name was. And I was always terrified or very embarrassed of my name because it was really hard to pronounce Christian Picciolini. 
um, you know, to a 12 to 12 year olds is, is a pretty right. easy name to make fun of. You know, I heard yeah. everything from like pick my weenie to you know, <laughs> you know, pick that's a, a good one. Pick, though. What are, yeah. I think we, that we share that given my last name <laughs> yeah. is McCracken. So I, I yeah, guess, there you, go. you know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and I was scared to tell him, but when I told him he didn't like bully me for it, he put his hand on my shoulder and he's like, Hey, that's an Italian name. You ought to be really proud of that kid. Cause somebody wants to take that shit away from you, you know? And I didn't know what he was talking about. You know, I you knew came how to... on that strong, that fast. That, like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, the eighty, the late eighties were a hell of a time, man. Yeah, and then he offered me a cigarette, and then it's like you know, it was like the, it was like yeah. he was older than me. He was twenty, I don't know, I think he was twenty four, twenty, maybe even twenty six at the time. Yeah. So this guy, this guy that walked up to me, of course I didn't know it. His name was Clark Martell, as you know if you've listened to the podcast, <clears throat> was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader. He wasn't America's first neo-Nazi skinhead because there were kind of like flavors of that, even on the West coast, like a, like a single, like, you know, skinhead mm-hmm. and a group of punk rockers that would like, you know, have a big swastika t-shirt or something like that. But he was the first one to say, and he was tied to Metzger speaking of the segue from Metzger. He learned how to kind of harness young people for the first time in this white power movement. Mm-hmm. He, this guy, Clark Martell, who recruited me that day learned that, Young people were the future, and frankly, he started the, the the white power skinhead movement there, and that's actually what we saw, you know, years later marching in Charlottesville. It was just a different iteration of the, of that youth movement. Um, yeah, t- and, ties and uh, ties and clean cut hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> Metzger, he, Metzger was in Fallbrook, California. Okay, that's right, outside of San Diego. Once you're hanging out with these with these guys, because I never. I was like a poser when I was trying to be <laughs> a Nazi, right? Like I didn't know Joshua. any, like I just, so, but, but. We would have loved you. I know, right? But <laughs> yeah. I, if, I, if only I had been in that alley. Uh, um, and I was, you know, I'm looking for a dad, really. But, but uh, at that point, are there, are there like, did you guys hang out with like in a group? Did you guys chill out together and go to the bar and like hang out? Were you no. buds? Not, we didn't go to the bar. I was 14 years old. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we hung out in that alley and there were a lot of other skinheads at that point. There were, you know, maybe a dozen other skinheads from, yeah. you know, anywhere. I was by far the youngest, but anywhere from like, you know, 16 to, you know, 25, 26. And they'd mm-hmm. drink beer in the alley. They'd listen to, you know, bands and, you know, music out of a, you know, boom box. Um, this is, this was before, you know, iPhones and, and Bluetooth, uh, car yeah. stereos kids. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was fun and it was right. cool. I mean, dare I say that because at 14, I had gone from like this really nerdy bullied mm-hmm. invisible kid to suddenly, you know, this kid who was sipping on beers in the alley with 20 right. year olds and they don't take and, shit from anybody. And they don't take shit. And you know what happened instantly? I noticed that because when I would walk down the street with now a shaved head and boots and these guys, you know, one of them, you know, always, we were always together. One of them with me, those bullies would cross the street and they'd avoid me. Mm -hmm. And suddenly Mm -hmm. their tone changed Mm -hmm. and suddenly I could be by myself around them. And then suddenly they wanted to join me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was weird uh, because it was like a, you know, I'd gone from this like repellent to a magnet all of a sudden. And they were looking up to me and those kids that bullied me then started, like I started to recruit them hmm. and then they would go out and they'd bully other people. Of course. Yeah. When did you realize, I mean, cause th- there's, I feel like there's kind of a moment when people that have that kind of charisma re- kind of realize it to some degree. Like what, what was that transformation like for you? Because you like, it wasn't just that you were like, a kid involved in this, like people, people were attracted to you. You had a lot of sway eventually when, you know, Martel went to prison, you kind of took over his position or did take over his position. I shouldn't say kind of, but like, when did you kind of realize you had that kind of attraction for people? Cause as a shy kid, I can imagine that it was probably kind of shocking in some ways to realize that this all of a sudden you're like, Oh shit, I'm super charismatic and people like me. Yeah. And I never want to make light of, of, you know, the eight years that I, that I spent involved in that. Um, Yeah. You know, it started out, I think very innocent and, and, you know, I was scared. So when you asked me like, when was the first time I had a doubt, 
the night after that alley meeting when you pulled right. that joint out of my mouth. That was yeah. the first time I had doubts because I was like, this is so foreign to me. I have no idea what this is. It was so out of my, like I was this like sheltered little Italian kid. You have to understand that. You know, my grandparents and parents were came straight from Italy and I was like this sheltered Italian kid. And suddenly, you know, I was, there were all these concepts about, you know, you know, anti-Semitic concepts and who was running the government. I'm not unlike what we're hearing now with a lot of the conspiracy mm-hmm. theories, yeah. like QAnon and things like that. Um, and um, yes, but I never want to make light of it because I spent eight years and I went from this innocent kid to somebody who, you know, at 16 then took over the recruitment of that organization that, you know, that after Clark went to jail and then who at 18, you know, or 17 started a band that made music that was racist music that is still, you know, uncontrollably around the world in places like YouTube and places where I mm-hmm. can't, you know, despite my efforts, you know, get, it get rid of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then at 22, you know, went on to be the, the director of the Northern chapter of a really deadly and violent skinhead group. Uh, how, how did I do that? It was, you know, it was intoxicating, uh, mm-hmm. because, mm-hmm. you know, I started to get, um, and I had doubts every single day, but the rewards that I was getting from that identity community and purpose that I was talking about mm-hmm. from within that bubble was greater. It was getting louder than the voices that were, right. that were telling me, don't do it. This is wrong. This feels really weird. This feels right. very out of your, you know, outside of your DNA or against your DNA. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you, you can tell me this. Uh, I would imagine it might be a lot like somebody who is a heroin addict who knows what they're doing is killing them yeah. because you're not a stupid person. You, you, you realize the effect it's having on you. You have a clouded view of it, but you, re- you recognize it, but you still do it because there's that reward, that, whatever that reward is that you were getting from it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it it is similar. The, the endorphins. I mean, I find when I speak now, if I do like something bigger where I'm speaking to a larger audience, I get that same kind of rush at times, you know, when I'm talking about social enterprise or my recovery, you know, it, it has a, there's, it's intoxicating. And, you know, I think the interesting thing is, and, you know, you obviously, you kind of shook the, the need for the attention at some point, but that, that thing that happened is probably the most interesting there were part to me of your story is like the kind of the awakening that occurred and then the guilt and remorse that you felt. Oh, geez. But, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that I, and cause that's the same thing for me as a, as a drug addict, I, there was so much guilt and remorse about the things that I had done. And I felt it was almost like I was living an altered state of, of being not just from the physical standpoint, but like spiritual in a way, like I was just like, you know, out of my body to some degree and just like a robot doing these things. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I felt really ashamed of all of it. So um, you know, maybe talk about that. I know in the process then, cause you, you have, I mean, there was a marriage and you know, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot that happened. It wasn't just this, like you weren't just doing this. There was a, you had a, you, you were living a life. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a single dimension, which is, you know, it's easy for people on the outside. And, you know, I had plenty of fights with skinheads out here. I've been a long time sort of, you know, now they call it Antifa, but you know, back then it was, it, the, you know, it was anti-racist action and some other groups and sharp and yeah. And so, you know, on from my, my dealing with sort of my feelings around it has changed a lot too. So this is like having you on and being able to hear how that you transformed yourself is encouraging me to continue the path that I'm on too, and not be like writing people off, you know? Well, you, well you're encouraging me too, and you're yeah. inspiring me. Thank you. So. Yeah. And, and th- those moments were important, right? There, you know, I, I, like I said, I had doubts every day, but there were definitely pivotal moments that occurred during that eight years from the time I was 14 until I was almost 23 uh, when I left. Uh, and the first one was, you know, at, at 19, uh, I met a girl, um, fell in love. Uh, she wasn't a part of, of the movement. Uh, she was kind of like this punk rock kind of punk rock chick more like you know new wave like the smiths and stuff like that mm-hmm. she was into like morrissey and stuff and um and we fell in love and we got married and we had two kids together and we you know we're married for uh, almost four and a half years and that was the first thing in my life 
So I got into the movement at 14 for eight years. Then I had the movement, but in the, in, in the middle of that, the only thing that ever challenged my identity, community and purpose was this new family that I had. Right. Cause I had to ask myself, cause at that time, the 19 or 18, 19, I was, you know, at my peak kind of in the movement, right. Had a band. I was traveling all over the world. I was, you know, performing overseas with this hate rock band. And here comes this girl and this, this, you know, newborn that say, you know, you, you can't be a father and a hate monger. You really, they, you can't love and, and hate at the same time. You really can't do that. Uh, and my community, you know, I had to make a choice. Was it, you know, choosing the one that I had physically given life to just now? Mm -hmm. uh, or was it to choose the one that I artificially surrounded myself with because I, you know, I needed to boost my ego and, and feel better about myself while I was hurting right. other people. Uh, and, you know, my purpose, uh, and I'm very big on those three pillars, but my purpose was challenged. Mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I was it to like, destroy the world or to like actually raise a family. And that was the, that was the first pivot for me. That was a big one, right? I didn't make the right choice because eventually at four years, my wife left and she took the kids. And that was, I think the, the end of the second pivot, the beginning of the second pivot was just before we got divorced, I tried to compromise and I tried mm -hmm. to pull back from uh, my leadership role within the movement. And I, I compromised with my wife and I said, I will, I'll go legit. I'm going to open up a record store. I'm going to sell music. Right. Awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, but yeah, awesome. No, because I, <laughs> my main goal was to sell white power music that I wow. was making and importing from Europe and, right. it, you know, but I also sold punk rock and I sold, you know, ska and rockabilly and psychabilly and some hip hop and, you know, death metal and some black metal and whatnot. And it was like an underground store, but most of 75% of what I sold was white power music. But it was at that store, despite what I was selling and, and, you know, despite the fact that everybody knew what I was about. And this was before the Internet. People were still buying records and right. they had to drive from California to do it because I was the only store selling this stuff. Um, but I was also meeting people for the first time in my life and having mean, meaningful interactions with them, people who were black and who were gay and who mm. were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And it was in my store because, you know, my parents were, were, you know, small business owners. I kind of had like the spirit of a small business owner. I wanted to be a good businessman. And when they were in my store, I bit my tongue and they knew who I was. They came in there. Now I know they came in there because they were challenging me, you know, with right. compassion. Uh, and um, they came in and over time I, I got to meet some people there that I really grew to respect. And one of those instances uh, was a young black uh teen who would always come in and never buy anything he'd never he'd always be really goofy and just kind of like loud and like shuffling through stuff but friendly you know but it's kind of annoying but funny uh and then one day he came in and he wasn't funny and it was like a stark contrast to how he'd always been and and i you know in conversation learned that his mother had been diagnosed with cancer with breast mm. cancer and it was right around that same time, maybe a month earlier that my own mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And I just, you know, found myself like lost in this conversation with this black kid, not even knowing he was a black kid. Like we were talking for, you know, probably what was, you know, 10 or 15 minutes about our mothers and mm -hmm. forgetting about anything else. And it was, that was another moment. Um, and that was around the time when I got really ashamed about what I was doing and stopped mm -hmm. selling the white power music. Uh, and because I stopped selling the white power music and it was 75% of, of my sales, I had to shut the store down and that was both terrible and great. Uh, mm -hmm. it was terrible because it was same time. My wife had left me and taken the kids. I didn't leave the movement quickly enough. Uh, right. I lost my job, uh, and I wasn't, you know, really marketable or hireable anywhere else. I was a Nazi skinhead. Um, and, um, it was great because it was an opportunity for me to walk away. And it was also terrible because I lost this exposure to everybody that I had become really friendly with. Right. But I wasn't sharing those experiences with my guys. Um, and, uh, but it was great because I got to walk away from the movement. Um, but I didn't do it in a really brave way. I, I, you know, I didn't tell them off. I just told them I'd be back. I need to go work on my family. I need to go find work and I'll be back guys. And what I did instead was run as, as fast as I mm -hmm. could. Uh, and I never looked back and I wasn't brave enough to tell them until, you know, a couple of years later, or roughly around like 2000, uh, when another really major thing happened to me. Uh, and by that time I'd already left the movement, it'd been about mm -hmm. four years, um, four and a half years. And I'd, you know, made friends, I'd moved, I'd 
kind of covered my tattoos with long sleeves everywhere I went. And I didn't tell anybody about my past. Uh, I tried to reinvent like a new life without, mm-hmm. you know, taking any accountability for what I had done. I wasn't the same person and I was treating other people, uh, you know, with respect and, uh, but I wasn't really treating myself with respect. Um, but you know, this kind of girlfriend that I had at the time said, you know, like, listen, you're in bad shape. You know, we got to kind of do something. And she offered to, uh, recommend me for, uh, a job where she had just started working at a temp company, uh, through IBM and, uh, you know, IBM, the tech company. Yeah. And, uh, I thought she was nuts. <laughs> Uh, because like I was, like, I didn't even own like a computer. I like had no resume. I don't even remember what I would have even put on a resume at that point, except that I owned a white power record store. Um, <laughs> not a good look on the resume, but luckily it was like an entry level job. So I, it was okay. And, and I ended up getting the job. It was installing like computers, literally installing them, turning them on, networking them to the system, uh, you know, like at large scale, like universities when they would like you know, order 500 computers because they were replacing all their old ones and mm-hmm. spend like a month and a half there and set them up. Except it was awesome and because uh, I got offered a job that saved my life at the time. But it was terrible because it was actually uh, where I'd be spending my first day of work was my old high school. Um, <laughs> the same one I'd been kicked out of twice. Wow. Uh, and yeah, no, talk about karma. Uh, yeah. I was like in hell because... And IBM had no idea. Like, I want to be clear. They had no idea about my past. I'd been hiding it. Um, Mm -hmm. And they, you know, you're going to go to District 218, you know, um, know, report there, meet the project manager. He'll instruct you, you know, you're going to be spending a month there. And I was so scared because I knew the minute I walked in that somebody was going to be like, get that guy the hell out of here. Bad experiences. Um, And I, you know sit-ins for like white student unions there have been fights in the hallway there were you know pickets out in front of the school in front of the school that i'd organized with other students and things like that and it was it'd been years since i'd been there but it was i knew they'd recognize me and and in fact i recognized somebody that i had hurt while i was there uh like as soon as i'd walked into school on my first day of work and it was uh you know the mr holmes the the black security guard he was the head of security uh, Mm -hmm. when, when i was in high school and uh, when I recognized them, I knew I had to, to do something. I didn't really have a plan, but I knew I had to, I knew I had to confront my past, uh, but I didn't know how. And, and when I kind of followed him out to the parking lot and, and I ran after him, I probably on second guess shouldn't have run <laughs> after him because um, I think I scared him. When I tapped him on the shoulder, he turned around and when he recognized me, he was really like afraid of what he had seen. Right. And I, I didn't know what to do, but I said I was sorry. Um, and, you know, I kind of talked to him a little bit and I just remember him like looking at me and saying, that's, I'm glad you're sorry, kid, but uh, that makes you feel good. It doesn't do a whole lot for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're going to have to do a little bit more. And I remember that's when he challenged me and he mm-hmm. told me, he's like, you, you know, you gotta, you've broken some stuff along the way and it's your responsibility to fix it. Mm-hmm. He said, I know you were just a kid, but like you know, you hurt people and you got to, you have to take responsibility for that. And he really was the one to encourage me to start telling my story, to start seeking out the people I had hurt uh, as best as I could. And, and to really kind of, you know, pay it forward uh, in some way. And, and I've been spending the last 20 years um, doing that or trying to do that anyway. Um, partly by helping people, you know, disengage from, from hate groups, uh, you know, I always say, like, I, I am that person. I, I'm trying to be that person that I wish would have come up to me in that alley that day instead of Clark Martell. I was going to say, are you are you walking around finding kids smoking doobies no. in alleys? And, <laughs> no. Saying, hey, man. <laughs> Nobody got time for that. Um, <laughs> that would no, be a lot of work. They find me. You know, it's like they find yeah. me. And and um, and now, you know, like they sometimes, you know, most times it's a parent or somebody that knows somebody. Or sometimes it is that person. And it's not always a kid. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's an adult. Or Oh, that was what I was going to ask you is if most – the arc of most kids is yours is that they kind of age out of, of it. A lot do a lot do. Um, you know, there are a lot of people and that's kind of the third bucket of people I work with. So some are like what I call bystanders, like a family member that says, Hey, you know, I know somebody, my son, my daughter, my girlfriend, Mm -hmm. boyfriend, coworker, whatever is in bad shape. And I don't know what to do. Can you help? Um, the second group is like the actual person who's in and says, Hey man, I am having doubts and, 
you know, right. I went out. And then third is like the person like me who maybe got out 20 or 30 years ago, but has never told anybody. Right. They've never talked about it out loud. They've run from it. Right. They've, you know, in some cases had to wear long sleeves, you know, in front of the people they love or when they go to the beach because of the mm-hmm. tattoo. They're not the same person and they've mm-hmm. spent their lives, you know, being a better person. Mm-hmm. But they've also like had this trauma inside of them for 20 years that they've never been able to, to talk about with anybody because it is, you know, they've com- they've traumatized people for sure. But, you know, I think also part of that is, is the trauma of having been through that and, uh, and not being able to talk about the trauma that, you know, of hurting other people as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's one of the, the, the differences between your sort of change and recovery from that. And, you know, people like me who have, there's a ton of support groups out there and people are encouraged to talk about it. It's not as stigmatized, you know. Um, even though it is, it's just not as much as kind of what you have come, come back from. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, I had, we all have kind of those key moments in our lives where somebody just like, it's like that laser focus, like they get you right. Like they look you in the eye, but they get you right here. Right. And it's just like something happens. You just kind of like, Oh crap, that's right. I, there's more I can do. Um, what's it been like to watch for you? Because I know one of the joys for me is watching other men kind of come out of it and, you know, recover on the other end. What's it been like to watch people like go, go back and like make amends for the things they've done and, and sort of like that light kind of comes back on. Like, how does that feel at this point for you? Yeah. I mean, and as you know, it's a long process, right? It's not an overnight thing. No. Right. And it's a lot of like, I feel like, you know, in your, in your world, maybe it's like a sponsor you know, like that's the role I play, but I am doing that for, I feel like about 400 people right now. Right. Um, which is overwhelming, right? It's hard. Uh, and everybody's at a different stage and everybody needs a little bit of different, you know, level of support and everybody is surrounded by different support. Some with a lot, some with none. And I, you know, obviously in the age of, of COVID, you know, we're not seeing each other in person. Um, but also, you know, I work with people all over the world, you know, mostly in the U S and in, in Canada, but I work with people all over the world and I, I can't possibly be everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, what I do is I develop networks of people around them uh, Great. as much as I can replicate that support network, that resilience building network, because it's about repairing those potholes, right? Those motivators that, that sent people to the, you know, that detoured them to the fringes where they found that identity, community, and purpose. I've got to not only help fix those potholes by finding, you know, uh, mental health professionals and doctors and educators and job trainers and life coaches and tattoo removal, you know, people and mentors and things like that. But I've also got to help replace the identity, community, and purpose they found in that toxic environment with something healthier. Um, And as you know, like, you know, with addiction, it's also about, you know, making sure that you have positive and healthy outlets, people that you can trust, people you can be vulnerable with when you need to be. That's why AA was so great because it it gave me all those things, right? Like I had a community and a purpose and all this Mm -hmm. stuff in one package. So, But are you training people? You're like Luke Skywalker and you need to train other (laughs) Jedis. Man. So Um, I, I... I, I, we love Star Wars references too. So. <laughs> That's awesome. I just bought a, a Boba Fett Lego set that I'm looking forward to the, the head, the helmet I'm looking forward to putting together. Oh yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, no, I am, I am training people. I have, you know, volunteers and I'm actually in the process right now, very excited to announce of scaling the organization to really better meet the need uh, you know, with case managers and, and with, you know, uh, uh, you know, psychologists who are on staff to advise on certain things and then building a partnership network. Because like I said, we have to build a network around everybody we work with. So we can't recreate the wheel every time, you know, somebody reaches out to us and it's easier in places like Oakland or, you know, uh, but it's not in Paducah, Kentucky, you know, where maybe there aren't a whole lot of resources for people. Uh, So yeah, it really is about, you know, and I always say, you know, it's got to be about the accountability. Redemption with a, without accountability is really just privilege, right? Right. We, we well, and that's that's actually something I wanted to 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 kind of kind of drill in on. And I know, like, you know, as having watched a lot of the kind of the the MSNBC stuff and the, listening to the podcast, reading your first book, like the stories, the story is the story, 
you know, there, everyone's got a story. But I think what what is interesting to me, because I'm sure I'm going to get pushback from some of my more hardcore anti-fascist friends sure. for even like comparing recovery from addiction and all this stuff. You know, people totally. just have their own feelings. And I, I have had people say to me that I've gone to very few times, but that have said, you know, fuck you, dude. I don't want to. Your apology doesn't mean shit to me because. Of oh, what yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> like, how, how does that play out for you? And like, how do you sort of process those feelings? Because I think part of the the deal for people on the outside of that, the white supremacy movement, when people leave is sort of, how do we encourage without like saying, you know, it's okay. It's okay. And coddle, like, like, how do you kind of, how do you kind of. Absolutely, man. No. And, and, and sometimes I know I use kind of examples and, and other words and metaphor and yeah. metaphors and things like that. Cause it's easier to explain. Cause you know, racism sometimes is really so hard to grasp. Right. Um, but there is a difference. It is, it is different. And, you know, people are, you know, whether you're 14 or whether you're 40, you make decisions and those decisions in that world hurt people, right? Physically hurt mm -hmm. them, sometimes yeah. kill them. Um, and, and even the words that we use, um, you know, especially in this day and age of the internet and Twitter where they live and are amplified, you know, millions and millions of times and, yeah. and live forever, we have to be responsible. We must be responsible for the words that we use. And, uh, and um, you know, we're, we are in a world where words are, are they carry and people act on them. Uh, so, you know, in relation to my music, I know that it's still influencing people. Mm -hmm. I'm still responsible mm -hmm. for that. So, yeah, you know, for me, it, you know, if accountability is not part of the equation, it, it, it does not work. Um, I do think that there needs to be breathing room for that person mm -hmm. who's on totally. their way out. And I'm going to use again, the word recovery. I don't, you know, I don't know if yeah, that's no, the no. appropriate word, but just to kind of paint that metaphor, you know, for that person who's exiting, you know, that world, there needs to be some breathing room, but then in, but there must be that accountability along with that self reflection uh, and to, in a commitment to repair the damage that was caused. Right. That is, that's paramount. It because it's not a pity party, right? It's no. actual actionable stuff you can do, right? Right. Listen, well, everybody, I, everybody has potholes, right? People experience trauma. Not everybody becomes an extremist. Yeah, totally. Right? And so I think that's no the, yeah. And I think that's the, and one of the things that's carried me through even now, and you know, I, I will say, you know, it's, it's like, you know, kind of like, oh, I have 22 years clean and sober, you know, that's great. Except, you know, like two and a half years ago, I realized that I had never dealt with my childhood traumas and the re-traumatizing that I did to myself when I was living on the streets. And all of a sudden I'm in like intensive therapy again, you know? Mm. So it's a constant process of like detoxifying those old ideas. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that in sort of studying the, the, the white supremacy movement, and I've had, you know, as Joshua can attest to, I've gotten into like brutal, like social media, like, you know, basically like not, not where I'm like, fuck you, man. But where I'm like, like people are like, oh, you're being, you know, you're being like oversensitive. It's not, the problem isn't as bad as you think. And I'm like, you know, it is actually, and it's worse. And we can see how, how easily people's minds are like sort of changed and, you know, and influenced by what's going on right now. We had an election that was the, the outcome is clear and very exacting. And we've got, you know, however many millions of people that don't want to believe it, you know, and like, that's how hard it is to pull people out of kind of their own reality. And so, you know, I think, you know, definitely kudos for the work, but you know, the reason I asked the question is because, you know, I've experienced it on all levels and I'm not just talking about shit I did when I was using or drinking, like mm -hmm. shit I've done in the last 22 years I've had to clean up and it's not fun. It is not fun. And it takes a lot of responsibility and a lot of accountability. And, you know, I, I just think, you know, it, that's part of the reason that I think that what you're doing, your organization and the fact what you're talking about essentially breathing room is let them detoxify their brain enough to get to the point where they can take some accountability for their actions. Because if you try to fucking send people out to the wolves at that point, <laughs> you know, I can speak for guys that have tried to go, go out and do amends too early. And it is a disaster on every level. 
And, you know, so that's why I was asking, like, how do you deal with the feelings when people are not willing to accept the apology too? You have to be okay with that. I mean, it's, it is not their responsibility to forgive you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, It's also not their responsibility to be (laughs) nice, nice to you. You know, if, if, if they don't accept your apology, you have to be okay with that, but you have to not let that stop you from moving forward in the world to try and repair that damage in other ways. Right. You know, we can repair it directly to the, you know, the, the tears that we've made to try and stitch those up if we can. But I think in general, I mean, like once the the virus is out, it's not just limited to those terrors that we. You know, <laughs> right. Sorry to use that metaphor, but no, but that's true. We have to go. We have to go out into the world and live our lives in a way that repairs the damage. Generally speaking, and and yep. are proactively being anti-fascist, are proactively being anti-racist, are proactively, you know, uh, in, in, uh, raising up the people who've been marginalized along the way. Yeah. Who, you know, who things that we've subscribed to have hurt for 400 years in our country. I mean, let's, you know, there's, yeah. we've got a lot, we, you know, we've, as somebody like me was complicit in a lot. Uh, but yeah, you know, to your point, now we're living in a country where the things that 14 to 22 year old me believed because he was handed, you know, pamphlets in an alley, uh, now, you know, arguably maybe 70 million people might believe the same types of conspiracy theories. Maybe that's a, a I shouldn't, uh, let me take a step back. I'm going to apologize for using that number because I don't actually believe that to be true. Right. But there is a significant number of people who now are, you know, believing the same types of conspiracy theories that, that I believed, you know, in those mm-hmm. pamphlets and, and, you know, Metzger me- newsletters and things like that. Um, because the internet is, has made it like it's a 24 hour hate buffet yeah, that you can go totally. you know, chow on any, anytime you're hungry, you're starving for, for that identity, community and purpose. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing that makes this conversation interesting for me and for, for our purposes in terms of the theme of the show is, you know, you've, you've had a lot of mainstream media sort of, you know, acknowledgement. You've also, um, you've done some pretty amazing, like stuff in terms of your, the awards you've gotten for the work you've done. But ultimately when I look at like the organization and what you're talking about right now, this is a grassroots organization that really is fundamentally based on many of the ideas that we learn when we're punk kids, you know, you got to do it yourself. You got to go out there and fucking get it because no one's going to do it for you. And so we talk about on the show a lot, the things that we learned from punk rock that we take into the things that we're doing now that we, that inspire us. Right. You know, and so like being able to, to, to plan a, you know, a book tour is like going on tour with your band, being able to do a, just do an event is like, you're, you know, you're an event planner because you learned how to book a fucking show, right? right. You know, oh, you yeah. sold records, you, you distributed information to people, like all those things that we learn as punk kids, we get to turn that around and make it into like super awesome business practices because it's inclusive as well on top of all that other stuff. Yeah. And so that's where you know, when I say, when we bring people on the show, it's, it's what we really get into around how we brought our punk childhood into our adult lives. And that's why it's adulting well, you know, so, totally. you know, and like you didn't get a chance to listen to any of the episodes, but we, we sort of circle back to this in all of them. And that's one of the things I want to just say about your organization is that this wasn't something that like, you know, it wasn't like a, a corporate sponsored, you know, you know, <laughs> or even a religious sponsored, you know, group, this was something that you had to like, think about work on curriculum, get out to people. And that, to me, that's very punk rock. I think like, people lose in the abstract, the the actual like time and effort and hours and things that go into doing <laughs> stuff like this. Well, let me, let me tell you how punk rock it is. I mean, the organization is, is literally all volunteers, including myself. None of us get paid because we, you know, we're really bad at fundraising frankly we, we hate asking for money but we're really good at, at raising our voices and doing the work that needs to be done right like you know we want to help people we know we can help people we have volunteers you know psychologists job trainers you know former you know skinheads and and extremists who have made you know have repaired the damage or are still repairing the damage that, that they've caused but are willing to help these folks it's very much diy i mean we still make our own posters we still you know it and uh you know and, and even in my personal life like when i first 
published my book, I self-published it because I didn't want to mass manufacture it. I wanted to print 50 copies for my family and my friends. And then somebody got a hold of it and was like, hey, this, this is kind of an important story to tell. You might want to think about, like, here's my, my friend who's in publishing. Uh, and, and that's how that kind of worked out. And it was really just about getting on the streets, being passionate about the work you do, and doing it because it's the right thing to do, not because you're rewarded in any way for it. Um, and uh, still like a punk rocker, I, I, I still can't figure out how to bring home a paycheck. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, I mean, I will say, honestly, it, as far as the organization goes, the fact that you're volunteering as well, being the person that founded it, right. Yeah. Um, it rings with more authenticity to me personally as a long-term, you know, as I mentioned, a, a lifelong anti-fascist to have people that were so deeply involved in the fascist movements in the U S do things because it's the right thing to do rather than a paycheck. It feels much more authentic. And, and I think that's part of the reason why I so respect and love people's stories when they really do truly change. And you can tell, I mean, you know, when someone's being inauthentic, I mean, if you've been through all this shit and you've been involved in, you know, especially the punk scene, you can kind of tell when people are in it for, you know, for like a personality goal, goal or ego or whatever it is. And, you know, so that, that is a commendable attribute to have in the organization and for yourself too. And um, so I you, we're, you know, this conversation, as many of ours go, goes so fucking fast, but, um, you have, uh, reconciled with your, your kids. Correct. Yeah. I, I yes. I mean, I never really lost sight of that. I mean, from right. the moment that even when, you know, my wife and I, uh, 23 years old or 22 and a half got divorced and, yeah. and I always had custody of them on the weekends. I never gave that up. I always wanted to be a good father. She was always an amazing mother. I mean, it was, we, I was, I lived, you know, we talked earlier about like, I lived this life. I lived two lives. I yeah, was mm-hmm. a good dad. Like I want, mm-hmm. I didn't bring that stuff home, even though my wife knew about mm-hmm. what I was doing and she was against it. She was, you know, kind of an anti-fascist of, of her time. Um, like I didn't really bring it home. Like I didn't want to, like, I didn't want it to touch them. So I live, you know, two lives, like one outside. I don't care what anybody says. This is so similar to an addiction story <laughs> at every level. Even that part, the two lives. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think totally. people think that, like, you know, there was love in my life. Just yeah. like there was love in, you know, in an addict or an alcoholic's life. You yeah. know, like they, they, they are, they can be good people, but they're, yep in many ways overcome by this other part of their life totally. that for whatever reason, um, you know, is, is tough to pull away from. It's tough, you know, even though I knew, and, and that's important, I think to say, even though I knew I was a hundred percent certain that I was wrong and I knew I needed to leave, it was hard to leave. Yeah. Well, you start identifying that becomes part of you, right. To some degree. And I know hard. even, even now, like here we are 22 years later, I don't, unless I'm playing a show with my current band or like, Dude, there's a very band? specific reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I play, yeah. I play, <laughs> well, right now it's not as awesome as it could be, but Kevin's um, the hardest working man in show business. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, me and Kevin have a lot in common, you know, I, we know. Do. Like, you know, we, I know two my, kids, my, a boy and a girl my glasses on and then like, we could be brothers. Yeah. Totally. Oh my god! Well, my my uh, my mom. You guys have fam- to take over this show. My mom's family are from Sicily, so you know. Very cool. Yeah, even though my last name's McCracken, the uh, <laughs> the other last name is Spatafora. So there you go. Um, but um, so you got to. I'm going to give you a dad brag. Tell me about. Tell us about how proud of your kids you are, because I'm I'm sure you are. I can tell by the look on your face when I brought them up. You're like, ah. Well, I, we couldn't have timed it better. It is their birthday this week. Ah. Uh. So, uh, I have two boys, uh, their birthday. And, Are they twins? Oh, that's right. You have two boys. No, no, they're not. So oh, they're okay. a week, they're a week apart in uh, two years oh, apart. So yeah. Devin, uh, my oldest son, uh, who's in California, who we talked about earlier is, uh, just turned 28 yesterday. Nice. And uh, my younger son, Brandon, who's here in Chicago, uh, is going to turn 26, uh, next week. And my birthday was a week. We're all like these November babies. I'm the I'm the third, the eleven, and then Devin the eleventh. And so the twenty eight year olds out of the woods. The twenty six year olds in for a rough year. <laughs> in my experience, in my experience, the twenty six, twenty seven was was rough. I think we're all in for a rough year. Yes, yeah, no, yeah, that was a rough year for me for sure. 
Yeah, I, I he's doing great helped. though. I got to say, my my kids are nothing like I was. They're doing just fine. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Is so the there ones a are, place that we can? Uh, I don't want to forget to um, get a website or something where people can go to a support you and get you guys some money if they need it. B reach out if they know anyone that needs help, and C volunteer if they have any services. Yeah, for for any of those, they can go to freeradicals.org. Uh, and, and while I say we're terrible at fundraising, we do accept donations. That's actually how we operate. Uh, you know, most of everything that we've done in the past has been funded by my speaking engagements and things like that. I take all that money and I don't draw a paycheck for, for any of that. Uh, and I'm not doing that right now. So, you know, we're, we're in the, in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, yeah. so yes. Uh, but you can do all that at freeradicals.org. Um, yeah. But I just want to say like my kids, like they saved my life, you know, yeah. like it was, it was them. It was me wanting to be such a good father to them and knowing how ashamed I felt that I hadn't lived. And I should say they were three and one mm-hmm. when I got out of the movement. So they were never yeah. really exposed to it. It was really their birth that, yeah. that made me make that decision that my life falling apart in the store closing and all that stuff. My life really kind of fell apart at that time. Well, I mean, um, it, it usually happens all at once. I mean, that's kind of the deal. Otherwise, you don't get the point, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, I had a I, when I was when I cleaned up, I had a I had a stepdaughter that I was helping to raise, and she we're still really close. She's she's older than my kids that are that live with me, but um, yeah. she her and I text all the time, and she's like she's clean now, which is great. And so we talk about recovery and, you know, it's just like a, you know, kids are just so amazingly loving and so pure, especially when they're young and they, you know, unless you're like, you know, even when, if you do really fuck up, they still love you. That's the amazing part. Was it like it for you? Like, I, I think I was really afraid of being a bad influence on them. Yeah. And I, I was totally ashamed, like, I foresaw like what they would be if I continued down that road and I didn't want to be responsible for that. Like I felt really I mean, embarrassed by that. It's, and it makes perfect sense. Right. I mean, so let me ask you, cause we're, you know, we're running close here. Um, we try to keep it to an hour to respect people's time and, and our time. But so you mentioned a couple of times, the conspiracy theories that are going on right now. It's something we had Anna Merlin on a couple of weeks ago and she's a, she, she was our, like, I think, election week, uh, guest. She, you know, I don't know if you know her, she writes for vice magazine, but does a lot of stuff around conspiracies. And I, one of the things that I've been sort of like, you know, in my sort of obsessive anti-fascist stuff looking at is the, is the histories of these conspiracy theories, especially Q and how much it relates to the anti-Semitic, you know, conspiracies that date all the way back to like the middle ages. I mean, this stuff goes back forever. And you know, I'm noticing that a lot of people in the wellness community, people in recovery, people in yoga and, and, uh, you know, all these other wellness kind of communities are really falling into this as well. Yeah. And, and there's this sort of this mindset and, you know, I've been victim of it. Like I went to the rehab I went to was hardcore. It was very cult like, you know, and, and then, and there are certain aspects of AA that can be that way in my opinion. Um, but like, I'm watching these people that have like been, taught by teachers who went down for like sexual abuses that have kind of fallen into this trap over and over again. But now they think like they're researchers and they're really smart Mm -hmm. and they're not seeing the connection between how how the ties to racism and anti-Semitism. And it's just, it's wild to me. And it's, I'm not saying, obviously I'm not saying every Trump supporter is a QAnon person because that's not true, but the, the pervasiveness of it across so many different seeming political stances is crazy easy and that's how deep racism goes in this country yeah i mean and and there's fuel coming being kind of poured on our our american racist fire from the outside as well right like as you pointed out you know middle ages you know what's really interesting and anti-semitism really is kind of the canary in the coal mine always at the core of these conspiracies if you dig there's you know you know it's george soros now but back in you know in the 70s and the 60s it was the rothschilds and the Mm -hmm. rockefellers and you know, before that. So here, you know, we talk about like Russian fake news and propaganda like today, but yeah. if we go back to like 1906, right? Early 1900s. The Russian czar had a very important book commissioned at that time. Mm-hmm. It was like early 1900s. Right. And that book was called uh, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Right. right. Today, even today, it is the most influential anti-Semitic trope book mm-hmm. That that influences everything from neo Nazis to even groups like the Islamic State, 
Mm -hmm. Uh, It is it is the supposed leaked minutes of a secret meeting of powerful Jews who had who were conspiring to control the world. Like it was they were having a meeting about, you know, we're going to do this in finance. We're going to do this in the media and this in news and entertainment. And the Russian czar, because he wanted the Jews out of Russia at the time, published this as if it were real. He had it. he he, He commissioned it as if it were real and leaked it. Right. That that book. That you know that piece of Russian fake news from 190 whatever is still the basis and kind of like the structure of fake news today and influences everything from QAnon to neo Nazis to uh, you know parts of the militia movement. I mean, you can go on and on and on. You will always flat earthers that. too. It's it's like uh, yeah. everything eventually gets there. It's crazy. Yeah, and and what I was going to say is to your point about like you know these kind of self help communities is. These recruiters really know where to go, where vulnerable people are who are searching mm-hmm. for that sense of identity, community, and purpose. People are going yeah. there because they are not trying to join a cult. They're not trying to join a hate group. They're going there because they there's something about it that drew them in that makes them think it will make them a better person. And they're not leading with swastikas and like arms. No. And they're leading with like, you know, we're going to make you a better person. The male, uh, you know, the men's rights movement is starting to really oh. kind of do this <laughs> now. Like, you know, come be a better man. And what they teach you when you go there is, you know, once you're in long enough and, and you're somebody like me who can see from the outside is very, very toxic, you know, misogynistic, yeah. you know, male toxicity type language that is also always in these types of, you know, rooted in these conspiracy theories and these hate movements. So, yeah, we have to be careful because, you know, while we're going there for the right reasons to get something out of it, we also have to recognize that there are manipulators and recruiters from all types of really bad movements who know where to go to find vulnerable people. Right. Not everybody there is going to be vulnerable. They don't need everybody. They just need a handful of people. To right. Off. Well, and that's 14 year old kid in that alley. Yeah. And well, and that's the thing that's amazing to me is these are people that I consider to be incredibly intelligent, compassionate people. And yet they're falling for like blood libel. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, are you fucking crazy? Like, look at the history of this stuff. And then they tell me to do my research and I'm like, I've been researching this my entire adult life, you know? And I'm not even saying that. And people are like, oh, you're being sarcastic and snarky and you're being, you know, condescending. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to be a little condescending because you're bluntly being dumb right now. Like, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying that to say you're a stupid person. I'm saying that because you are not being in your right mind right now. And how did and that so penetrate I, you when, when you were using? When somebody yeah, would exactly. You? Not at all. You know what I mean? Like people would come, one of my best friends that I'm still like, I love this guy. He's like, and he got clean after me, ironically, um, came and tried to find me on 16th and mission in San Francisco. And I saw him on his bike, pushing himself around, looking for me. And I hid from him. Because I didn't want to be confronted with the reality of my situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think the the kind of, as we wrap here, I think the, the question that I would like to kind of, you know, leave everybody with, and maybe you have a, a, a short answer to it, or you can think about it and, you know, post something about it later is when you know somebody in your life that's kind of fallen for these, these tropes, whatever it is, whether it's white supremacy, the Q conspiracies, they kind of all go together and you can see them wavering a little bit. What's the most compassionate way to get your in at that point? Like what's, what works for you? And it, you don't have to give me like the long version of everything, but just kind of like, how do we engage this without making people feel bad? Yeah. I mean, I think the most important thing is to, is to not be so wrapped up in the end result. Like they're a member of QAnon or they're a neo-Nazi is to kind of like listen to like what's underneath all that armor that they've put on. What are the motivators that led them there? Right. right? What are the potholes? And then, Listen for what those potholes are and become a pothole fixer. Right. Mm, nice. Nice. Well, as we wrap up, um, you've got a new book out, which I'm about to start. And I would, if, if you have not read or heard Christian stories, I think the easiest place to start right now is probably the podcast from WBEZ. Um, motive because it lays everything out really clearly. It features you, but it also talks about some of the people you've been working with and some of the, especially a particular person that you've been trying to kind of draw out of this current Trumpian sort of uh, identity Europa. It's a really heavy podcast, but 
it's also very honest. And that's why I liked it. I mean, it was very, very honest. There's a lot of heavy stuff in there. And there's stuff that if you're sensitive to to, you know, hearing racist ideas and and stuff about violence is hard to listen to, quite honestly. But take it slow and listen to it or read the first book. Um, your your most recent book um again is uh Breaking the, Hate. Yeah, Breaking Hate, confronting the new culture was, of extreme. Yeah, extremism. and I was gonna say, you know, to if people want to hear about that that whole concept of identity, community and purpose and potholes, that's really what this whole book is about too. Yeah. I'm super excited to start it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I've gone from being like a hardcore fighter to a, like, how can we not, I'm not, I don't give any slack to Nazis. You don't, you know, don't get that you wrong. Shouldn't. But, but if somebody's willing to make a change and wants to listen, how do we do that? And how do we own that part of it on the other side so that they, we can actually make changes because the, the idea of genocide on either side isn't going to work, you know? Yeah. Thank you so, for that, man. And I'm really, I'm really proud to know you and I'm really, I'm proud of your story. Both thanks. Both yeah. You too, man. And I think it's important, you know, uh, that we as, as men can be honest about these things can be vulnerable and talk about it. Um, so that hopefully, you know, the generations behind us can, can figure it out a little bit easier than we did. Maybe I, I, I say it all the time. One of my favorite things to do is just kiss my son all the time, like hug him, hold him, kiss him, love him you know, and, and show that affection and be, I want to be that dad, like all the time, you know, like if he, when he's at the age, he doesn't want it. I'm fine with that, but I'm going to get all I can get. I was just going to say the 28 to 26 year old, you still got, you got to run after him these days, but, I still do. <laughs> but they'll change. I know I did with my dad, you know, in the last, the last 20 years I've been, I force hugs from him. <laughs> so anyway, well, thanks for coming on Christian. Uh, you know, you're easy to find on the internet. Um, Kristen, christianpicciolini.com and then you can find all the other links there um as we tell people we donate our patreon money until the end of the year to hospitality house sf that works with individuals that have are struggling with mental illness and um need help as well as people that are recovering from substance abuse and are living on the streets of san francisco they use my two favorite things art music therapy um and they really work with people where they are and there's it's not a judgmental program so much love to them and um you know obviously your uh your nonprofit as well and thank you and i think art and music are the truest form of empathy you literally have to put yourself in that person's shoes who created it to feel to experience to do that mm -hmm. so great organization and i look forward to seeing your band play someday thanks <laughs> uh yeah and thanks for listening everybody <laughs>